thing. Um, there's an old clip from South Park, I believe, where Butters is sad and some people are like, oh, oh, that sucks. And he's like, yeah, it sucks, but the fact that I am sad means that I'm alive and can experience happiness and sadness and everything. It makes you feel alive. And I always disagreed with that. I still disagree with that. I think that's dumb. And being able to feel alive isn't inherently a good thing. It shouldn't be treated that way. Um, especially if you're sad all the time. Um, but being sad is not so bad. Uh, I don't expect everyone to relate to this. Um, it's certainly a, a specific, a specific, something, something idiosyncratic, something, something that, that I feel is related to my particular experiences and worldview, etc. Or, or something like that. I, I'm not sure no one will. What I'm saying is, being sad is not so bad. Um, there's a Nirvana song, and the lyrics go something along the lines of, I miss the comfort of being sad. And, um, for a short time when I was happy, for like four months, I wasn't sad. And it fucked me up, because I've been sad for a very long time. This was a few years ago. I was sad for, I've been sad for a very long time. And so when I went like four months of not feeling depressed, it kind of fucked me up on an existential level, because... Some people view emotions in a strange way, which I believe comes from a, a, a lack of mastery over the self, which, of course, mastery over the self is nothing to be cocky about. It's a lifelong challenge, even the most practiced meditators and monks and people like that struggle with um so it's uh, it's it's not something a young man or a young woman or anything in between could uh could could call a a a reasonable goal but that's not necessarily the point it's not necessarily about about the the destination it's it's one of those things that's about the journey not the destination because in a sense that's one possible purpose to life not the purpose to, i won't go as far as to say that's the purpose to life but one a good argument could be made that that is a strong purpose to life is to master yourself. I I mean I I I'm not sure I'm not entirely that well versed in in Buddhism and things along those lines, but self self mastery, self control, self understanding, full full fully. I believe is very very similar to the idea of enlightenment that that exists in in Buddhism. Um, uh, it, I, I, I'm not sure necessarily. Again, I'm not super well versed, but that's that's how I've interpreted it from from what little I do know about that sort of thing, and that would seem to make sense given how 
how Buddhists talk about enlightenment, how like everyone is already enlightened, they just need to figure out that they are, which would make sense, because technically everyone is already in control of themselves, since you are yourself, you have to be in control of it, but uh, you just need to figure out that you're in control of yourself, you just need to, to work it out. And I think that's why a lot of people have the view that uh, th their emotions are something which comes from from the outside. Like, they're something that happens to you. You get sad, you get happy, something like that. It's something that just happens to you. But, um, of course, that's not really the case, because they have, they must come from, come from within. I mean, in a sense, material conditions, material things could happen from the outside which could lead to you being happy or sad and that's nothing, that's that's not, I'm not I'm not saying your typical bullshit self-help thing of depression is a choice or anything along those lines that's of course not true um what I am saying is, depression may not be a choice, but it is a choice to how you how you accept it, or whether or not you accept it. I accepted that I would be sad for most of my life, when I was around like 14, 15, maybe 16, or I'd begun to accept it. It's not really... It's a, as I said, all of this is an ongoing thing that that everyone has to sort of deal with at some point. But um, you know, do you know? I don't know. What were I talking about? Ah yes. Emotions aren't something that happens from outside of your control. There's something which you can control your response to, you You may not be able to control the unconscious processes or the material conditions which lead to the emotions, sometimes you can, but you may not always be able to, and that's okay, but you can choose to accept that being sad is not so bad, um, that doesn't necessarily mean you'll stop being sad, it just means that you'll be okay with being sad and it's well being okay with being sad is is uh, something that, that that I feel pretty accomplished at not always of course I'm I'm not always okay with being sad and sad is not one homogenous thing to be sad comes in many many forms intensities, reasoning, all of this stuff, melancholia, loneliness, anhedonia, all of these things are sad, but they're, you know, a sense of impending doom, or grief, loss, or maybe just frustration, all of these things are sad, but they're not the same type of sad, and, and all of them kind of take time to accept, or, or not accept. You don't necessarily have to accept everything that happens to you. Um, how do I put this? Being sad is not so bad. Uh, I, I think I don't mind being sad. Uh, a lot of my favorite art I get to enjoy on a deeper level, or relate to on a deeper level when I'm feeling sad, feeling low, feeling down. I can listen to my favorite DSBM albums and my favorite grouper tracks, things like this. And even though I may not be 
happy, I feel like comfy. Because there, as Kurt Cobain said, there is, there is comfort in being sad. It feels almost like the ultimate excuse. You don't really have to worry about your emotions because you're just sad. Um, and being sad all the time is not the ideal form of life, but by running away from it, what are you what are you achieving? Like respite, perhaps, but really, it's it can only ever be temporary respite. I, I don't get me wrong it can be fun to have respite it can be nice it can be fine but that's all it ever really is 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 a brief respite from, from sadness and do you know what like is that how much is that really worth I wonder Maybe, maybe I shouldn't have been playing Counter-Strike while recording this. I feel like I may be distracting myself somewhat. Um, I'm not playing seriously. Anyway, so it's not important. You can... You can be sad and still fulfilled. <laughs> Being happy is actually quite unfulfilling, especially because if you're someone who's sad most of the time and you become happy, there's some sort of feeling at the back of it which reminds you that this is temporary and you're going to go back to feeling sad soon. Um, and some people might find that to be incredibly depressing and nihilistic or cynical, whatever. But I find it comforting. And I think this is something that that I've seen on Twitter um, from an Orthodox Christian fellow. I forgot what their name was. But um, this, this, this Christian fellow was, was trying to... He's one of those... One of those um, it doesn't really matter what he is. But, but his, his idea was to, to essentially counteract the idea of nihilism being being something edgy that 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 nihilism is supposed to be or is often viewed as something which is which is very like edgy or, or a way of looking at the world that's from a very depressed standpoint or cynical standpoint but in reality it's actually a very optimistic view to think that oh none of this matters and he his argument was well I'm sorry, folks, but the sad truth is all of this matters because you, you, you're gonna. It's a test for where you end up in eternity for, in his Christian viewpoint. Um, that that morals, if morals are absolute, then they they're important. Um, well, that was his view. I don't subscribe to that, but he's not wrong about nihilism being a a a uh, something that's comforting and sometimes that feels like an easy way out but also it, um, there's not necessarily anything wrong with easy ways out so it's it's some, somewhat of an Occam's razor situation where, where oftentimes the easiest way out is in fact the best um, if you have an option for an easy way out, uh, then why why go for a hard way out? If you want a way out, but really my whole point is that the best way is to simply um, learn to appreciate it, because when you spend as much time in this headspace as I do. You become very familiar with it, and it becomes quite nice. It's some something like 
playing a video game that you've played as a child, and you know it might not be the best game of all time, but you ha you're so familiar with it that it's it's just quite comfortable, it's quite a nice experience. Even even if it may not be the most enjoyable thing, uh, traditionally, it has its appeal, and that's what's important. Um, there was a big point I was trying to make here. I had a, I had a good metaphor or something, but I have completely forgotten what it was, and that's fine. Just like most things, are fine. So so, what I'm saying is, I think you've got my point, but. Emotions don't come from outside. No. They come from inside. I'll just reiterate this. They come from they come from within your head. You 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 in you don't necessarily choose your emotional reaction, but you do choose your your way of dealing with the emotional reaction. Um and that's what's known as emotional maturity. And uh maybe this is just as someone who was a big fan of Star Trek as a kid and related a little too much to data. Uh, who is, by the way, closer to autistic than than your, your your typical Spock? Like you know, in in the first in the original series, you got Spock, who's like an emotionless Vulcan, but he's emotionless because he he learned, as all Vulcans do, to suppress their emotions to pursue logic. Uh, whereas Data is emotionless because he was he's an android who is he was he he was, wasn't he doesn't have an emotions chip in him, uh, and his interest is is actually the opposite. He's he's interested in in learning him to to have emotions rather than your Spock your Spock situation where he's he wants to suppress his emotions that he already has, or arguably could have, whatever. Um. In, f in favor of logic, data is doing the opposite. He's searching for a way to become more human by emulating and understanding what it means to have human emotions. And I don't remember where I was going with this, but I, I really, I, data was my favorite character as a kid. I, I loved it. There's an episode called Data's Day, which was my favorite episode growing up. Uh, I believe it's in s season six. I want to say season six, but I also it could be season four. I don't remember. Uh, but it's a great episode where it follows data and like a kind of slice of life thing of him going around. It's quite, it's like a comedy, it's like, an, it's not a serious episode, it's a comedic episode following data. It's very, very entertaining. Would recommend. Um, um, but yeah, the da data is, 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 is someone who, and the thing that data understands in, in one episode of Star Trek, um, he, he plays a, a, this fictional game. I forgot what this kid's called. Um, the episode is... Oh, fuck. What's it called? Um, it, it's the ep I, I, I forget the exact the, the name of the episode, but the, the plot of the episode is that there's, a, there's some sort of training, training simulation that, the, the, uh, that Riker is going to take some of the crew to go on another... Oh, okay. It doesn't... You don't need the whole context. But, um, I'm just saying in case you, you, you've seen this episode, is that, that, that there's some guy comes aboard, and Riker is going to take his bit of crew onto this other starship that's kind of outdated, and they're going to have a battle simulation with the Enterprise as, like, a tactics practice. Um, it's a very good episode, but as part of that episode, there's a... The data plays a... a oh, Stratagema is the name of the game. Strat uh, there's a fictional game called Stratagema, and someone comes aboard the ship who's like the, the world's expert at Stratagema, and Data ends up pl uh, playing this guy at Stratagema in order to try and like bring him down a peg, because obviously Data being an android can do loads of calculations in a second, and, and would, would easily be a, a, a conscious being, in theory at least. Uh, so, they play, and Data doesn't win, and that's like the important plot point, is that Data doesn't win, uh, Data loses to this guy, and he's like, but I didn't make any mistakes, and 
he sort of gets in a whole tizzy because he thinks there must be something wrong with his programming because he's like, I lost, but I didn't do anything wrong. And there is an amazing quote where Picard goes and talks to him. And Picard says, it's possible to make zero mistakes and still lose. Oh, I, sh I, need to, I should look up the quote, actually, so I don't get this wrong, because he says it in a very elegant way. Picard. Um, here we go. It is possible to commit no errors and still lose. That is not weakness, that is life. That's the quote. It's possible to commit no errors and still lose. That's not weakness, that's life. And that is just... That quote is very powerful. I think everyone could stand to to, to pay attention to to take heed of that. That sometimes you'll make no mistakes. You you'll you'll be doing everything as well as you can, and it's not fair. Don't get me wrong. This is a game that doesn't make sense, and that you're put in with no consent, right? Uh, however, is running away from the problem or in pretending the problem doesn't exist is arguably even worse, is not really helping anyone. It may help you to be less sad, but being sad is a, it's not so bad. Um, and so it is possible to commit no errors and still lose. And that is life. That is, that is something which is just a, fundamental to life, to, to being a human, and as much as so many of us wish we could be not human, it's still escapism if you're doing something along those lines. You're still, and again, escapism isn't always bad, it's just not a permanent solution. Rather, a, a deeper understanding of yourself is is almost certainly a better solution to this. The deeper you can understand yourself, the easier it will be to, to understand certain emotions you may feel and certain responses you may have, certain mistakes you may or may not have committed, and character flaws, or, or just m things about you that, that you may not know. It's a, it's a, it's a fascinating thing, uh, yourself being yourself, uh, it's, it's quite fascinating, and even if that self that you are being may not be happy, trying to run away from that is just, this, you may as well just join a cult, just, you can do it, I won't say you can't do it, but it seems to me, for me, my best option is to simply do what I can to learn and grow from the experience, from any experience, from sadness, from happiness. The sadness is quite comfy. And they say, or I say they say, but it, 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 it is often said that you should seek discomfort. I forgot who's... Oh, that's a, that's a fucking... Seek discomfort is like the slogan of a, a pretty rubbish YouTube channel. But um, it isn't a... Like, it's emblematic of a very neoliberal uh, philosophy of... Um, it's, it's actually somewhat... Protestant philosophy, or or, or or Christian in some way, related to some sort of idea of original sin that 
that are, or that we mu we must suffer in order to grow, and that is not true. The truth is, sometimes you just suffer, and there's no rhyme or reason behind it. No errors have been committed. Sometimes you just suffer. And how you respond to that is definitionally how emotionally mature you are. How you respond to just completely unfair, unfounded awful suffering that is, for many of us, I'm sure watching this channel, just a fact of daily life. Not whether you choose to see it as a some sort of holy flagellation or a way to grow yourself, but rather whether you choose to... to hmm. Whether you're simply okay with being sad, whether you're just able to to find some satisfaction in it, whether not not satisfaction, but really just able to take a step back and observe what's happening, able to look at look at yourself with 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 clear eyes. That's something not not easy it's it's not not an easy task but for me it i've had no other option and therefore i've just sort of done it <laughs> it just sort of happened without me trying now not not for all, every emotion and not for every time i'm sad not even for every type of sadness um Hold on a minute, gotta kill this guy. Oh, it looks like I'm gonna die. Oh, I didn't die. Oh, I died. Fascinating. Um. You don't necessarily have to accept sadness and be be pleased with it. Is what I'm trying to say. And this is not something that's very easy to put into words. So I, I do hope you'll forgive my somewhat fumbled delivery here. Um, I'm not. I'm not the most eloquent speaker, even at the best of times. Uh, I've completely lost track of my my train of thought here. Um, you don't necessarily have to accept sadness and chase it as some sort of flagellation ritual, you know. You don't, like some people, who choose to, you know, a lot of this, this is, um, like a Sikhism type of thing. Um... Let me put it this way. Have you ever seen someone who you think... Anyone, not in real life necessarily, but anyone who seems to have their shit together in old age. Someone who may have had a troubled life or anything, but just someone who you think is maybe a, a, a wizened old man. Could be fictional even. Um, right, someone who seems to live a satisfied life. They always tend to have the same general traits and pretty much all they say is you've just got to not worry about the shit people are telling you to worry about and just try and enjoy the little things in life have learn learn to make something and then devote your life to it doesn't have to be one thing, could be many things. You could continuously change up what you make and how you make it. 
Just don't get complacent. Um, don't get complacent. Don't chase the comforts of the base reality. Chase transcendental comfiness. Transcendental comfiness is so, so, something that that means being on an incredibly deep, the deepest level, just generally okay with being being yourself. And that's not something that I ever necessarily think I'll achieve. That's possibly the the loftiest goal that it's possible to have. But. It doesn't really matter whether you get there or not. What matters is that you take actions in order to try um, and get there. What matters is the journey of, of the quest in order to get there. I, I can't say if anyone has ever got there before, but this is why I don't think being sad is so bad, because it's just another step on this this journey to just being something that exists rather than being all sorts of jumbled thoughts that I currently am that everyone really is and I'm not necessarily one to say things like like this, like this seems something very, very, I don't know, I think a lot of people seem to get the wrong idea from these, these types of thoughts, people seem to think this means, I don't know, people, people seem to think this, oh fuck, well the video's over because I've run out of space, so, Goodbye. Well, my camera seems to have cut out at some point during that strange talk. I've I've come back to it. I was thinking I was simply going to upload it with that sudden ending, but well, it didn't cut out. It my phone ran out of space. Um, but I've decided to come back and do a little supplementary um addition at the end, which will be. Related to something I, 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 I just was going through my phone, clearing space because it ran out of memory. I stumbled across a bunch of old videos I took while I was on acid, of me explaining to my future self, about the. The how, there is only ever the self and the other. I would love to upload those videos, but I'm not going to. Uh, they they're just for me. Um, but to summarize, um, there is, when you get down to it, there is only ever the self and the other. I don't, there's some, some philosopher has this idea, I'm not talking about whatever that guy thinks. I think it might, I, I don't fucking remember who came up with this, or who, what philosopher talks about the self and the other a lot, but it's, I'm not talking about whatever he says, because I've never read it, but, um, Really, what I mean is, by the self, I mean something that's capable of observation, and by the other, I mean everything that isn't that. Um, and observation means that you have to be able to observe and pass. It, it's something which can understand what's, what it's observing, or at the very least, categorize, conceptualize what it's observing. Um, and, and that's you, or me, or whatever that's the self, and everything outside of that is the other. But, in reality, if you were to go in, as I put it, if you were to go into spectator mode, and you could see both the self and the other at the same time without you being the self, you would see that they're both just the same thing. But because you can't do that, that means the self must exist as something that isn't the other from a, an individual perspective. And also... At the heart of it all, at the heart of the self, is is the creative nothing. Like Sterner says, there's there's nothing, like there's no immediate line you can draw between the self and the other because it's all just the same thing. 
but there there it does exist from a it's kind of like um gravity being an inertial force or centrifugal force it exists from a certain perspective um but anyway uh, and and the interactions between the self and the other are governed by chaos pure chaos universal chaos and that essentially was what i was talking about uh and so what does this mean for what i was talking about well essentially because of that it means that 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 any sort of i concept of well that's not fair or that is fair or whatever as i was talking about like the idea of being born without your consent or bad things happen to good people all of these these topics life is meaningless or i have was born with a, a disability or whatever problem you might have um not being fair that's completely correct it isn't fair because it's just purely governed by chaos and because nothing is fair that means everything is fair because everything is just pure chaos and the sooner you accept that the better and in fact you you want you you're going to want to not simply it's it's something that's very easy to say you accept and very difficult to actually accept because the human brain is wired to search for patterns especially brain of autists is wired to search for patterns and, and to love data and things like this and what you have to understand or what and it's very easy to understand this on a conceptual level and very difficult to understand it on a true deep deep acceptance level which is that there are all these patterns and things are something which you put onto the world they're not something which exists they're something that only happens because of our observation they're something that you put onto things they're not something that things intrinsically have uh and this is something that's quite easy to say but quite difficult to accept and i definitely have trouble with this um and that's why it doesn't really matter if if it's fair or unfair because at the end of the day it's all just chaotic anyway it's all just disordered and and everything and the only thing you can possibly do you could you could try and fight it and certainly people do and certainly that's a losing battle and certainly people who fight it know that it's a losing battle and continue to do it anyway because they see that as some sort of purpose to their existence and i that's under well that's understandable i also think that's somewhat of a hmm, escape it's escapism but at once i again as i said before it's something that that is not a permanent solution it's it's simply an escapist temporary solution and th- there's nothing necessarily wrong with that but the thing about escapism is as soon as you accept that it's only temporary it loses some uh, some what its potency um and the best forms of escapism work better when you know their escapism For example, I'm a big fan of Iyashi Kei anime of things like Arya and while watching these things I completely understand and I'm conceptualizing how these worlds are different from the real world or video games how they're different from the real world and that's part of why you, I enjoy them because I can conceptualize them as as something which is escapist and separate um but I think the 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 more permanent efficient you useful for me at least p- uh pursue goal is to to try and accept the chaos and revel in it um and that can come across sounding kind of edgy joker from dark night type of philosophy but it it in the real life it's not like that at all because if you were to go out and try and create chaos you couldn't because you would only be creating 
something that's in your mind and by by going through the the actions required to create that they would have to necessarily be ordered and you would not be creating chaos you would just be creating a different type of order um of course it works as a metaphor in batman but i'm talking about real life here uh so so i i i feel like it's it's not a, a fix or end all kind of thing it's more like something that you can just point in the general direction of point yourself steer yourself roughly in that general direction and if you have made a wrong turn by mistake, that's also not a problem because wrong it's not necessarily about where you end up. Uh, it's just about exploring near Venetia. And uh, I think that's a good way to end this video.